for the line of fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before, followed by a short one at five seconds. Have a great afternoon, everybody. What happens when you're raised by two lesbian moms? What's your view of parenting? We've got an expert to weigh in today. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to the Line of Fire broadcast. We are going to have a very important show today. So glad you could be with us. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call, 866-348-7884. The first half of the show today, I want to speak with Katie Faust. She is doing something very, very important today. She is advocating for the rights of children in terms of homes in which they were raised, in, in terms of what children need as opposed to just what some adoptive parent or other parent may want. And she's got a lot of background and experience. It's going to be very important. Also, for all of you who heard or watched yesterday's show, I, I, I've got some clips to play for you that are going to be eye-opening, and we'll continue to discuss the question of anti-Semitism in the church. That'll be in the second half of the broadcast. But first, my guest, Katie's the founder of Them Before Us, the only organization solely devoted to defending children's rights in family structure. She's written many great articles about the question of the role of a mom and a dad, gay parenting, what are the downsides to that. So as a mom herself and having her own unique story, Katie is uniquely qualified to join us. Hey, Katie, thanks for being on the line of fire today. Much appreciated. So good to be with you. So, uh, Katie. What prompted our current conversation was Mayor Pete, I just use his first name because I always mispronounce his last name, South Bend, Indiana. He and his, quote, husband, Chasson, about having kids and about God made his partner to, to be a dad and things like that. And you have some concerns from the viewpoint of being an advocate for children, not from the viewpoint of being a hater or a homophobe or a bigot, but from the, the viewpoint of being an advocate for children, you have concerns about bringing a child into a world where, by choice, they're deprived of either a mother or a father. So share, share what you, when you hear these things, when you hear Mayor Pete talk, what, what emotions go through you? What concerns do you have? Well, first, let me say that my guess is that Mayor Pete and his partner husband probably would both be wonderful fathers. Like, I don't doubt that claim at all. The problem is that neither of them can be a mother. And for either of them to become fathers in their current situation, a child is going to have to lose their mother. They are going to have to lose a relationship with one person, at least one person, to whom they have a natural right. And that is an injustice, an injustice that is being so promoted and normalized today that now it sounds like progress, but it's really not, right? That kind of mindset that I have a right to a child, even if it means that that child cannot have a relationship with one or both of the people um, that are responsible for their existence, well, that's actually a very regressive view. And so when I hear the media promoting the idea that Mayor Pete and his partner, who are probably both very good men um, and probably would be great fathers, I think, how insane that you think that a child should have to sacrifice something that they are made for and something they have a natural right to so that two men can be parents in, in a relationship where um, they are deliberately, probably deliberately, cutting the mother out of the picture. Yeah, so again, this is by choice. No one's saying they chose to have same-sex attraction, but if they choose to bring a child into the world, there has to be a mother involved. No matter how advanced we are scientifically, every human being has a biological mother and a biological father. So you're making a choice that will deprive this child of either a mother 
or a father for life. So, Katie, you hear this all the time. Well, what about single parents? What do you say to that? What's the difference? So this is this is what we say at them before us. We support adults who do hard things so that children's rights are protected. A lot of people are single parents because they are the only adult in the relationship that was willing to do the hard thing and be a good parent to their child. So we are behind the adults that are choosing to do hard things. We are behind adoptive parents who are choosing to conform their lives to a child who has tragically lost their parents. We are for heroic step parents who are filling the gaps, filling, stepping in to fill the void that was left perhaps by um, a delinquent or abusive or irresponsible biological parent. But none of that negates the reality that children are the safest, most attached to, and most protected by, statistically, their biological mother and father. And that when we violate those norms or when we deliberately deprive children of those bonds, we are putting them at risk. And so Children need more than just love and safety. You know, they need more than just adults who care about them. They need and are made for and have a right to their biological mother and father. And while it's sometimes impossible for that arrangement to take place, the idea that we are now normalizing and promoting households where children will have to lose one or both of their biological parents um, is an injustice. Um, and, you know, I, you mentioned a little in your introduction, and I want to circle back a bit, just to my own background. Um, you know, my parents divorced when I was 10, um, and thankfully my parents remained friends. I was still in relationship with both my mom and dad even after their divorce. But soon after their divorce, my mom met and fell in love with uh, another woman, her partner, um, and they're both wonderful and I've, I've continued to enjoy a close relationship with both my mother and father throughout my life. And so I would not say that um, I'm raised by lesbians, but I will say that I love my mother. I love her partner. Both of them are incredible women, and neither of them could have been my father. And I'm so grateful that they didn't try. I'm so grateful that I got to benefit from the love, connection, and attachment with my father throughout my life. So um, being saying that children have a right to their mother and father is not anti-gay. Um, it's pro-child. And you can say children have a right to their mother and father and still, with all of your heart, love those in your life who um, have same-sex attraction or who identify as gay and lesbian. There's no contradiction at all. So, uh, Katie, you were, in that sense, not raised by lesbian parents. It, it would be a little misleading to say that. But you have far more insight, having spent a good portion of your life with two moms and without the, the physical dad present, can you imagine what would be lacking in you, what deficit you might have had, what part of your life would, would be kind of like a, a, a hole that needed to be filled if you, if you never really knew who your father was? Yeah. Uh, paint a picture for us. I don't have to us. imagine. Be yeah, I don't have to imagine because on our website, we have a story bank of children mm. who were denied a relationship with their mother or father uh, because they were raised in a same-sex headed household. And it's extremely difficult for several reasons. The first one is obviously that they're missing that dual gender input that all kids are made for, that they crave. There are certain things that dads give to their, their children, whether it's a son or a daughter, that mothers simply cannot give. Sociologists will say that there's no such thing as parenting there's only mothering and fathering. That's how different men and women are when it comes to interacting with their children. So kids who are raised in same-sex headed households are always deprived of that dual gender influence that is a critical part of human development. Second, many of those children didn't just lose a relationship with their mom or dad, they were intentionally denied a relationship right. with their mom or dad. And that actually sets things up for a very distinct um, developmental challenge. And that is that all children, when they're not being raised by their mom or dad, no matter how they lose them, whether through death, divorce, abandonment, donor conception, or surrogacy, I have yet to meet a kid who's not being raised by their mother and or father who doesn't wonder, who are they? Do they love me? Do they think about me? Do I look like them? Do they miss me? I mean, that is, it's just the nature of kids to wonder about the two people who made them and think about them. There is loss associated with um, losing a relationship with your mom and dad in a way that is traumatic and painful for kids. Now, kids who are raised um, 
in a same-sex headed household or kids that are donor conceived uh, who were intentionally separated by um, their parents who are raising them often feel that loss, often wonder about their other parents, but they're not free to express that loss because they're living with the people who are responsible for their biological parent not being there to begin with. Yeah. And so it sets up a difficult dynamic where the child feels like they have to support the desires of the adults who are raising them. In addition to that, you know, the kids on our website who have chosen to share their stories, who have same-sex parents, will say, I cannot talk about this. I cannot talk about how difficult it was to live with my father and his partner or be raised by two moms, because if I do... The world will say that I'm a bigot. The world will say that my natural desire to be loved by my missing father or to be loved by my missing mother is bigotry. And so this whole cultural narrative today is also silencing kids. And so kids who are raised in same-sex headed households, even though a lot of the time these parents are good parents. Um, a lot of the times these kids don't feel like they are free to process their loss and talk about the ways that they are struggling and suffering. And that in and of itself sets up uh, another layer of complexity for kids. Yeah. And I, I, I've heard from some of them themselves, like I love my moms or I love my dad. I don't want to hurt them, but, and the website anonymous us that came to my attention a few years back, and this was children of anonymous sperm donors and they would post stories and they would post poems. I read one of them on the air, almost broke down and then had the gal that had found yeah. it that come on. And you know, who am I? And I'm dating someone. They kind of look like me. Maybe that's my brother or my sister. What happens if we kiss or, you know, what's, is there a relationship? And does my dad, I just graduated high school. Do you think he knows? Is he, you know, and yes. because just an anonymous sperm, how much did you make? donating your sperm, you know, and do you ever think about me? And so again, I, I can't relate to that. And yes, a kid in an adoptive home, thank God for the adoptive mom and dad that are caring for that child and giving them a sense of identity. But even then the child still has this thing. They wonder about origins. And, and you're talking about, again, a case like this, where willingly a choice is made by two gay men or two lesbian women, a choice is made to bring a child into the world and by choice, to deprive the child of either the mother or the father. We come back. I want to talk with Katie about two things. What about we hear, no, 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 the kids raised in same-sex homes, they're doing just as well, even better than kids raised in opposite-sex homes. And, and then what's the difference? What, how does a mom raise a kid differently than a dad? How do they process things? What's the, the biological, the spiritual, emotional difference here? We'll lay these out, and then we'll tell you how you can find out more about Katie and her work. It's important. It's valuable. She knows that of which she speaks. We'll be right back. When I came to faith in 1971, in the immediate days after that, so I knew there were people that were called to be pastors, and there were evangelists. I knew those two. So the evangelist, that was someone that traveled from church to church, and the pastor was one state of one place. That's what I knew. And, and then I found out that there's some called to be teachers, that Jesus spent a lot of his ministry teaching that, that, okay, so that was another calling. But I remember asking one day, are, are there prophets around today? I asked my pastor, do you think there are prophets today? By which I thought of like an Isaiah, maybe in a cave somewhere today with a long beard and a scroll and right. And he said, yeah, I believe there's some prophets today. And, you know, the question of apostles, we didn't really talk about because you had the 12 apostles and that was it. But then you have Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11, speaking of Jesus when he ascended, that he gave the apostles, or he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, or pastors, and teachers. Now, some say this is what we call fivefold ministry apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Some say it's really fourfold apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastor slash teacher. Do these ministries all exist today? Yes, I believe they do. No, you don't have the 12 apostles or anyone functioning with that same authority today or writing scripture. But do you have people who are called to be apostles? Just like, for example, Barnabas is called an apostle in Acts 14. It just means a sent one. 
these who are foundation layers, who are spiritual fathers, who might be church planters, who might be movement leaders. I believe, say, someone like Hudson Taylor or someone like William Booth, I believe they were apostles, even though they didn't carry that name or have that concept, I believe they are. One of my friends in India has planted over 7,000 churches, has planted ministries in other nations, who's built hospitals, has been a prophetic witness for the Lord, who's almost stoned to death for his faith, were stoned for his faith. I believe he's a modern day apostle, even though he wouldn't use that term. And yes, they're clearly prophets today. Read the end of 1 Corinthians 12 and you'll see a prophets, apostles, all tied in together with, with miracles and teachers and administrators and tongues, all tied in together. Those who are hearing the voice of God. Is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us in this important broadcast today on The Line of Fire. Look, you're going to get called a bigot. You're going to get blasted. You're going to get attacked. That's just the reality. We have to speak the truth. In love because we care. We care about people. And here, Katie Faust specifically cares about children. Katie, let, whoa, we looks like we lost Katie there. I don't know what happened, Howard, but let's reconnect with her. All right. Don't know. I, I hope I didn't do it. I, I don't think I hit anything, but if I did it, I, I don't think I did. And anyway, we'll, we'll get Katie right back on the line. Um, <clears throat> there's a question from Brian and Charlotte. Brian, I, I want to ask Katie your question directly. But uh, you can connect with her. You can look up them before us, them before us. You can uh, them before us.com. All right. So I'll give out that info now. Them before us.com. <clears throat> Children's rights before adult desires. Great place to go. You can connect with her on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll get Katie back momentarily. <clears throat> but uh, Brian, you asked the question, how do parents deal with gay parents and children's TV shows? Well, one thing is if you see the show is going in a certain direction where it's going to normalize homosexuality in the eyes of children, then it's good to just say, you know, we're not going to watch that anymore. Or mommy and daddy think there's a better show or let's do something together that the kid really likes to do. If you feel that it's it's there, it's overt, it's now going to be a negative influence, all right? That's the first thing. The second thing is if it does come up as a question, you can just take the child and say, boy, that is such a mistake. They're probably very nice men or very nice ladies, but kids need a mommy and a daddy. God gave a mommy and a daddy, not a mommy and a mommy, a daddy and a daddy, depending on the age of the kid. I was I was in the gym working out one day, and a fellow was training me for a little while. And he said, I didn't know what to do. I was out with my son, Christian man. He said, I was out with my son, and, and he saw two men holding hands. And he said, Daddy, that's not right. He said, I didn't know what to say. I don't want to be mean. But I said, just tell them they're confused. Pray for them. Well, it's mean. They're not confused. Oh, or should I say they're willfully rebelling and, and hell-bound sodomite sinners. Are you going to tell the kid? No, tell, tell the kid because they're, they're sincere and they think, hey, this is good or this is fine or they believe it, whatever level of deception they're in. So you have compassion. Uh, and thanks, Brian, for, for the question. Uh, I may have to fill in for Katie. <laughs> Somehow we lost her. It does not, listen, I've done interviews. I was on with Todd Starnes. Uh, on, on his uh, national radio show a couple months ago, and we were really diving into the subject, actually like six months ago. And uh, the, the time frame we were doing that, I had to do it on my cell phone because it was in between office and home and so on. And I go to a location I thought was, uh, Mike, I can't hear you. We'll call you back. Dr. Brown, I can't hear you. Call back and lose each other. So I hate when that happens, but it does happen sometimes. You know what's interesting? And every mom and every mom and dad can relate to this. The way you raise your kids, the way you relate to your kids. Now, it, it's all stereotypical, but it's often very true. The mother being the more protective, the father being the more adventurous, the mother being quicker to see faults and problems, the father being quicker to see the, the potential and possibility. I mean, this this often happens. I remember when our girls were like junior high, thereabouts, late elementary school, early junior high, somewhere around there. And we were meeting with the principal of a school. He was a pastor and an educator. And Nancy was raising 
her concerns about one of our daughters. And, and I was saying, ah, everything's going to be fine. And he said, well, this is totally typical. It, kind of the truth is where you meet in the middle there. Hey, Katie, we've got you again. Uh, all connected here? All connected. All right. Yeah, I don't know how we lost you there. But but anyway, I, I was stuck having to be Katie for a little while. So I gave you a website, tried not to blow it. But tell me the difference in some of the most fundamental ways of mom relating to a kid, dad relating to a kid, how they raise kids, what different perspectives they bring. I mean, you've looked at this for years, but let's boil it down in a couple of minutes. What are some of the biggest differences in parenting? Yeah, this is so important. You know, we have done such a disservice in the last few years by trying to say that men and women can only be equal if they're the same. And so we've minimized these gender differences. But nowhere do these gender differences display themselves as magnificently as they do in parenting. So, um, you know, mothers and fathers play differently. Fathers tend to play with kids and mothers tend to care for kids. Fathers encourage competitions. Mothers encourage equity. I always use the example of Monopoly. Like when my husband is playing Monopoly with the kids, it is just cutthroat. Mm -hmm. I mean, my kids are like money sharks. And I walk in and I'm like, are you kidding me? Loan your brother some money. Come on, people. And kids need both of that, right? They need the fathers who are encouraging them to go farther and faster. And they need moms to say, hey, you've got other people in this family to look out for too. Um, fathers push limits. Mothers encourage security. You know, moms and dads communicate differently. Fathers' talk tends to be more brief, like, hey, take out the garbage. And, you know, moms tend to use more subtle body language, be more descriptive and personal and verbally encouraging. Honey, I know that you're finishing up your reading right now, but when you're done, if you could take out the garbage, um, that would be really helpful because I'm getting dinner. And I, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, they, so it's, they it's not, it's not stereotypical. Differently. Yeah, it's not stereotypical to say the father is throwing the baby in the air and catching him as the baby is laughing with glee and the mother's like, what, you're gonna drop the kid, what are you? That's not stereotypical to think normally no. it's not the mother throwing the baby around and the father running in. There, there are differences and the kids need the influence of, of both and, and without it, there's yes. a lack. So what about, you hear from gay activists, no, 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 there's no difference. Surveys have been done, studies right. have been done, kids raised by two moms, two dads, there's no qualitative differences in life and, and, and anything right. else. How do you respond to that? Yeah, Paul Sullins just wrote a great article yesterday in Public Discourse about this, a new book that was put out by Walter Shum examining every study ever done, yeah. the methodology and the conclusion of it um, on gay parenting. And so I will briefly say that those studies that show that there is no difference have major methodological flaws. They either use very small populations, they rely on parents reporting what they right. perceive the child's experience to be, they don't use random samples. I mean, it's not the gold standard of um, social science you know, research that you've been told should exist for massive population-based conclusions that they're coming to. And I like to kind of play this thought game with people. You know, I say, okay, look, Whenever you're not talking about same-sex parenting, sociologists tend to agree on four major things. Number one, men and women are different, and mothers and fathers offer distinct and complementary benefits to children. Number two, biology matters, that biological parents tend to be the most connected to, protective of, invested in, and permanent in the life of their kids. Number three, Anytime a child loses a relationship with their mother or father through death, divorce, abandonment, or donor conception, there's trauma, and those kids suffer diminished outcomes. And finally, that non-biological parents don't respond the same way to the children in their life, and that is why we have such serious screening and vetting for, for adoptive parents, because it's risky to place a child with a biological stranger. Now, whenever you're not talking about same-sex parenting, social scientists agree on those four things. And we have decades of social science research yep. to support that. So why is it that when you suddenly study gay parenting, when all four of those factors are going to be implicated, that there's suddenly no difference? Yeah, exactly. And the answer is because there's obviously um, a political factor um, involved, an ideological factor involved in those studies, um, not just data, not just good science, not just trying to chase the facts wherever they lead. Yeah, and, and Professor Walter Shum, for, for doing the research, gets academic persecution 
for simply going against the politically correct narrative. And as you mentioned, one of the issues comes up is, is that the reports rely on the parents' perspective. Oh, our kids are doing wonderfully. They're the happiest they could sure. be. And then the open secret, which gay activists talk about, is that people are not asking the question, well, are, is there a higher percentage of the kids identifying as same-sex attracted? Is there a higher percentage of the kids experimenting sexually, questioning their gender? Are the boys being feminized? Are the girls being masculinized? And the answer to those questions, oh, yeah, those things are happening, but that's considered fine or a positive. There's nothing wrong with it. So, of course, you're not going to get equal results when you change the fundamental equation so radically. Right. Well, yeah, and, and my issue is just that they're not actually talking to the kids themselves, right? Yeah. It is going to be a long time, a long time before you are able to find us this small population, children raised with same-sex adults, especially if you want to get them from the moment of conception. You know, that's the problem that activists will say, you know, to studies that do point to children who have suffered. They'll say, well, that's because they're the product of a heterosexual relationship that broke down and they had to right. go through the transition. Find me the kids who have been with their same-sex parents from the moment of birth. Those kids are going to turn out great. Well, that's a problem because donor-conceived kids who were raised in heterosexual households struggle disproportionately with trust issues, delinquency, um, addiction, um, feeling like they've got identity struggles. And they were raised in the home of a married heterosexual couple. So you're telling me that somehow these donor-conceived kids in same-sex head households where they don't have the dual, dual gender influence are doing great, but the kids raised with heterosexual yeah. parents, even though one of them was a sperm donor, have diminished outcomes? I mean, there's Obviously no not. way for yeah. the facts and the data to support their conclusion. All they've got is anecdotal stories, and all they've got is bluster. Right, and time will tell, just like with no-fault divorce. It took a while. Oh, it was best for the kids. Indeed. It took a while, and then studies indicated the opposite. Hey, Katie, we're out of time. Go, friends, to them before us.com. Katie is as articulate, loving, clear-headed, and advocate for children's rights as I know on the planet. Support her work. Katie, thanks for being with us again. Look forward to talking again. Thanks, Dr. Brown. What about the Talmud? Is it anti-Christian? Is it filled with attacks on Christians and attacks on Jesus? First, let's understand when we talk about the Talmud, there are two Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. We normally refer to the Babylonian Talmud. That's the more authoritative. That's fuller. That was completed a little over 500 years after the time of Jesus, just to give you context here. Some of the traditions go back to times before Jesus. Most of it is from after the destruction of the Second Temple and then even after the Second Jewish Revolt in the second century of this era. But these traditions were passed on their debates, discussions among the rabbis about legal issues, about biblical interpretation, about life. It's this massive compilation. It, it's, it's a lifetime of study to really understand it and master it. If we stack the books of the Talmud up here, they, they'd be this high, okay? So does the Talmud attack Christianity? Is it anti-Christian? For the most part, you're just reading about Jewish law and discussions among rabbis, and there may be folklore, there may be passing references to things, but it is, it is not polemicizing against other religions or polemicizing against Christianity. However, there are certain sentiments in there that are clearly anti-Christian. Now, we can go back to John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 41. This accusation was brought against Yeshua. John 8, 41. It, it says uh, this, uh, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father. We're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. In other words, you're born of sexual immorality. This idea that Jesus was born out of wedlock, obviously a Jewish response to the claims of the virgin birth, this is found in the Talmud. It is found a few times, these references in Talmud and ancient Jewish literature, derogatory statements about Jesus, or alleging that, that he deceived Israel, that he was a sorcerer, or things like that. Those comments are there. There are few and far between. For the most part, the attitude of Talmud towards other faiths, if the people are worshiping idols, that's wrong. Uh, Christianity is looked at as a heresy, but the Talmud is not primarily 
polemicizing against other religions. So does it contain statements you could call anti-Christian? Of course. Is that the heart and soul of it? No, you could, you could study for days, for weeks, for months, and never come across anything like that. So to characterize it as anti-Christian can be misleading, although for sure it has some very strong negative statements in there that would point to Jesus or the first disciples. But once more, few and very, very far between. A car has been in a flood. Go to www.nicb.org to check it out. God of light, hear our cry. Send the fire. It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Oh, friends, I, I am going to be totally candid with you. As, as I always am, you get what's in my heart filtered hopefully with wisdom and love, but you get what's in my heart. What you see is what you get. I did not see a certain type of attack coming. This is Michael Brown. You are participating in the line of fire. Number to call 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. I would love to open the phones to those that agree with Owen Benjamin, those that agree with Rick Wiles and True News, those that agree with Catholic scholar Dr. E. Michael Jones, those that agree with Reverend Ted Pike, who was on with me yesterday. I would love for you to call in. I would love for you to call in and speak your mind rather than just post it and snipe from online. Because I want to talk to you candidly. It's 6634-TRUTH. But I did not see this attack coming, and it's one of the saddest, one of the most pitiful, one of the ugliest, one of the ones where, where I feel so bad for the people attacking. But it's, it's coming out more and more because I have exposed anti-Semitism, because I have called out hateful misinformation being spread about Jewish people, because I've done that, I'm now told I'm not a Christian. Yeah, I'm not a follower of Jesus. Many lies come from traitor unto Jesus Christ by false convert Brown. The Goyim, Gentiles, know what you think of us on our Savior Jesus Christ. Repent, sir. And on and on. You should back down. It's so obvious you're a Jew trying to pretend you're a Christian. It's really disgusting. So, yeah, I, I feel bad for people that are that, are that in left field to even believe what they're, what they're writing. But I, I think they do. I give them the benefit of the doubt, say they believe what they're writing. And, you know, how would you feel if people thought, you know, they come by, you're, you're not, you're a Mar, you're from Mars. You're actually a gorilla posing as a human. You're, you feel bad for the people. You don't question like, could they be right? No, you feel bad for the people. So I feel bad for people that are that deceived that, for example, for example, when I say, I'm not a Talmudic Jew. I oppose Talmudic authority. I've written a whole book against Talmudic authority. I'm in constant battle with counter-missionary rabbis. Constant battle, all right? I, I expect in the days to come that I will be singled out for attack by Orthodox Jews more and more and more and more as we're more successful in reaching Jewish people. That's what I expect. I expect my life will be threatened, okay? But when I say, by the way, no, the Talmud does not promote pedophilia. That's a lie. You're not a follower of Jesus. Like, wow. Have you taken in the lies that deeply? Have you ingested the, the demonic Kool-Aid that deeply that you can't separate fact from fiction, y y truth from error? And that when someone, you might say, well, I differ with you, Dr. Brown. I have a different perspective on that. Well, great, fine. Okay, let's, let's get into it. But when you say, well, you're not a follower of Jesus, or you, you claim that, that Dr. Michael Jones, E. Michael Jones, that, that, that some of what he says is anti-Semitic, you're not a true follower of Jesus. Like, wow, you actually believe that. That's very sad. So, so listen, I, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for posting this. So this is awesome. From Sean, I'll give you post it with your name, Sean McGill. There we go. This man is most sawed through and through. Can I just make a request? I got a request. Since I'm a Zionist shill and a secret undercover Mossad agent, could someone tell them to pay me at least? 
could would someone just at least do that since I'm working for them uh, undercover for 47 plus years? Could someone tell them they should at least pay me because I've done a great job, haven't I? <laughs> do you, Sean, do you actually believe that? You actually wow, 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 utterly amazing. So here's what happens yesterday. All right. Somebody said, Dr. Brown, I was disappointed you yesterday. You, you, you ambushed Reverend Ted Pike. That was wrong. How could you do that? That was wrong. You ambushed the man. Well, I take those things seriously. People said, Dr. Brown, I like your show, but you, you mishandled that yesterday. So I actually went back at a full day yesterday. Then late last night, I went back to listen to some of the broadcast to reiterate what I knew. No, he was not ambushed. He was not ambushed. Now, I, I'm going to demonstrate it to you. Before the show, and I witnessed the call, my producer, Matt, called Ted Pike. Because here's, here's the background you need to know, all right? I had no interest in having him on the show to talk about the equality bill and gay activism because I can talk about that. I have talked about these things for years, and I have friends who are attorneys, Christian attorneys, conservative activists. I could have brought any of them on the air to talk about this. He contacts us, all right? And then my producer, Matt, says, well, Dr. Brown differs with you on Jewish things because every time he's attacking homosexual issues, he's going to bring up the, the, what the Jewish leaders are doing in, in, a, in ADL and the Jews, 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 and it goes back to the Talmud and their secret pedophiles and all this. He's going to bring that up. So I said, if he's coming on, I'm going to discuss my differences. With, Does he understand it? Yes. Are you sure he understands it? Yes. He called him right before the show. I witnessed the call, okay? I witnessed the call. Now, I, I want you to... Let's go back to yesterday's show. We're going to start with clip number one. And, and I want you, this is how I introduce the show. And these are my opening comments. Let's start here. Are we there? We're going to continue to explore the subject of Christian anti-Semitism. We are going to have a really interesting show today. And there could be some very constructive fireworks in the midst of it. Uh, Reverend Ted Pike leads the National Prayer Network, uh, Christian conservative watchdog, watchdog organization. Uh, he has appeared frequently before the media, dealing with lots of social and cultural issues. He and I definitely share a lot of concerns about where the culture is going, concerns about morality, concerns about homosexual activism, et cetera we would be step for step in many of those concerns. At the same time, he specifically feels that Jewish people, Jewish leaders in particular, are driving the gay agenda and other negative activist agendas that are hurting our country. And as stated in his bio here, in the tradition of Christ and the Hebrew prophets, Reverend Pike is an outspoken critic of ADL, that's uh, Anti-Defamation League's evil, Jewish leadership, and it goes on. So we're going to start with our areas of commonality, and then we're going to highlight our very, very different, starkly different views of the Jewish people and Israel. All right, so that's how I started off. The, the, the lead into the show, we're going to continue to explore the issue of Christian anti-Semitism. Then my intro, I go at, 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 take great pains to explain we're going to get into our differences and we may have some constructive forward because I had quoted him in 1992 in my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, as some of the worst, most horrific statements about the Jewish people, false, ugly statements about Israel and the Jewish people. I quoted him back in, in 92. That's why I was surprised. Why are you contacting us and, and, and et cetera? Okay, so that's how we start off. That would have been enough, but there's more. Clip number two. We want to start with our areas of commonality before we highlight our differences. I, I, I want to specifically discuss why you're constantly tying, the, tying this in with, with Jewish leadership, et cetera. But go ahead. You come back to the two things you wanted to draw attention to, and we'll make sure we, we cover this subject, and then we'll, we'll shift over to the Jewish role. So back to you, sir, to the points you wanted to make. So one more point on the bill when we come back, and then let's talk about the role of Jewish people. I uh, take deep, deep difference. I have deep, deep differences and take offense to statements Reverend Pike has made about Jewish people, but we're going to have a dialogue about it momentarily right here. He is a conservative activist. 
He also feels that Jewish people in particular are to blame for a lot of the social ills. He does not damn all Jews, but again, we'll interact with that. All right, so that's five times, five times in the first 15, 16 minutes of the show. We're going to talk about this. 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 We have differences. We're going to talk about this. Then, clip number three, I asked him, Directly, did my producer tell you we were, because he's like, we don't want to talk about this. We want to talk about other things and people accusing me of hand pushing him. It, it was quite the contrary. This is, a, this is an overkill to set the thing up as to where we're going. So clip number three, I ask him, okay, what did the producer, what did Matt say when he called you? Let's listen. When we gave you the invitation, did he explicitly tell you that I differ deeply with you and oh, I was yes, going to bring these so. and that yes. you were all for us discussing them. You said before coming on the air, my producer explicitly called to ask, can we go there? You're not letting me go there. All right, so he, he says, yes, we were very clear. I set it up five times in the first 15, 16 minutes. I only talked about the other bill out of courtesy to him. The bill itself is important, but I didn't need him on the air to do that. I did that out of courtesy because he wanted to. But my whole reason for having him on was to discuss my differences about Jewish people, which he weaves in on all of his social issues. He's constantly criticizing and condemning the Jews. And when I tell him he's he can't read Hebrew or Aramaic, when rabbis explain to him what the Talmud actually says about issues, that the Talmud does not sanction pedophilia. And again, I'm not a Talmudic Jew. I, I con I'm in constant battle with Talmudic Jews about Jesus. Constant battle. I do not submit to their authority. I do not su submit to rabbinic authority. I don't believe the Talmud is inspired. But when you, when you s speak misinformation about it, well, I'm going to address it. Does the Talmud speak negatively about Jesus? Very negatively. It could well be. In some places, there's debate. Is it talking about that Jesus or someone from another generation? Because the chronology doesn't work. But it could well be. It's speaking about him in very ugly, terrible terms. And Mary as well. Could well be. Not denying that. All right? But it, it does not promote pedophilia. <clears throat> so here, here, last clip, clip number four, then we're going to go right to the phones. When I explain to him the truth and tell him what the passages really mean, here's how he responds. I, again, I'm not a Talmudic Jew. I reject Talmudic authority. I, mean, I have a whole volume as to why I reject the Talmud, all right? Five, 300 pages uh, on that. But the, these are misconceptions. And to make the, the, rab, the ancient rabbis sexual perverts that is a statement Jesus would not the, the, make. My, Michael, the, the, the evidence is overwhelming, and, and what you're basically telling me here is the standard Orthodox Jewish subterfuge to try to whitewash these, these people whom Christ called uh, sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Amazing. So when you tell them the truth, what would the passages really say, that I'm joining in with the subterfuge. And, and can I just say something? I, I, I don't get to look at a lot of the comments in the YouTube thread. I love the interaction. I love some of you standing up for truth. Some of you really disappoint me when all you do is repeat a lie. We refute the lie. We give you evidence it's a lie. You just repeat the lie. That's disappointing because I want to help you. But it seems sometimes you're not listening. Is Satan everywhere at the same time? It is the devil omnipresent? I see no scriptural emphasis on that or no scriptural backing for that whatsoever. God alone is omnipresent. Angels are not omnipresent. Created beings are not omnipresent. And Satan is both a created being and an angel, a fallen created being, a fallen angel. You know, in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, after Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, it says this, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So Satan left, angels came. Neither of them are omnipresent. Just because Satan is a spirit being, and we can't see him, you get have the feeling, well, he's omnipresent. No, only God fills the universe. Uh, only is it said of God in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Only of God, as it says in Jeremiah 23, that he fills heaven and earth. It's not said of Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. Satan is a powerful, dark, spiritual being, very powerful, very deceptive, and he has a well-organized army of demon powers under him, 
whether those are fallen angels or wherever we get the class of demons from, and, and they are sent out. And when we resist demons, we are resisting Satan. When it tells us in 1 Peter 5 to resist Satan, it doesn't mean that each of us is personally resisting him because he's everywhere at the same time. No, he comes and he goes. Just like in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he leaves and looks for more opportune time. Satan is not omnipresent. Let's not give him credit he doesn't deserve. Only God is almighty. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipresent. Absolutely not Satan. Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Right, we are going to the phones, but first, if you appreciate what we're doing, taking on these lies. And friends, there's a price to pay when you stand for truth. There's a price. Early this morning, I was up uh, appearing on local Fox News talking about the war on gender, how we approach this in a compassionate Christian way. We're taking on the lies of anti-Semitism. We're taking on the lies of a false prosperity gospel and a hyper-grace message. We're taking on the, the lies that try to tear people away from Jesus, and we're doing it with joy and with grace. We're confronting radical Islam. There are countries I can't go and minister in now because we've called out radical Islam, but we do it with your help. So stand with us now. Here's a great way to do it. Pennies a day, become a Patreon partner. All right. If you go there right now, patreon.com. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, there's the link. Patreon.com forward slash ASKDR Brown. Ask Dr. Brown. Become a Patreon partner. We just started this $10 or more per month. So pennies a day as you stand with us. Not only do you help us get the message out more, produce more videos, but you get two bonus videos every single week. Exclusive there. So become a Patreon partner today. Will you stand with us? Thank you for praying. Thank you for your support. We go to Sydney, Australia. Angelo, welcome to the line of fire. Oh. Hello, sir. Hello, Dr. Brown, and how are you? I'm blessed, man. Nice to hear your accent. Nice. No, it's a nice. Oh, look, oh, it's very nice to speak to you. I've tried to get on a few times uh, to speak to you, but with no luck, and I'm so happy to be on on uh, on the phone to you, Um and, and I think you're doing a magnificent job, and God bless you. And uh, I do see you as, a, as a, a beautiful person who tries to help the Jewish people to come to our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm of Greek background and um, uh, born into Greek Orthodoxy, but I, I don't uh, call myself a Greek Orthodox. I call myself a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ above mm -hmm. all, and I believe in the unification of of all humanity and what you are doing is absolutely uh, wonderful and, and so blessed. Uh, and that's why I needed to speak to you. Well, go ahead, sir. Thank you for the very kind words. Uh, and God willing, I'm going to uh, be in Australia uh, next February. But in any case, uh, well, yeah, so your, your question or comment for today. Well, um, I was listening to your show with uh, Pastor uh, Ted Pike. Now, in relation to the uh, promotion of pedophilia within the Jewish um, uh, uh, religious systems that were at the time, um, so, I mean, obviously, coming from uh, co comments like that are, are not warranted at all because he can't identify any particular person. You, we can't put blame on anybody that's a pedophile or practices or promotes pedophilia in any way, shape, or form. Um, my my issue that I have is that that as humans we need to unify. So we need to unify, as you rightly say, and we all believe, under Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, I love Jewish people. I work in a Jewish area. Predominantly, mm -hmm. it's all Jewish here. Yeah. I don't live in this area, but I work here, and I absolutely love the people. So my question is. It's 2,000 years now since our Lord has come and gone and obviously going to come again. We are at this stage now where we don't need to question Jesus, whether he is the Messiah or not. It's either we believe or we don't believe that he is. We need to, to, to put it out there to the people. Now, where, 
when Jesus came, he said, I am God. Now, whoever rejects that statement does not believe in God themselves. So, in other words, whether you're Jewish, Greek, or any other uh, background, when you say you don't believe in Jesus, that means you don't believe in God. Because yeah, so, yeah so, so tell you what, Angela, let, let me just jump in for, for time's sake, because I, I do want to get to respond, all right? And I'm so glad you got through today. Here's, here's where I would start. When a Jew, a religious Jew, says, I don't believe that Jesus is God, in their mind, God is not a man. God does not become human. God does not take on corporeal form. If, if he does, then, then that being is not really God. What I would rather do is say, okay, we agree there's one God. We agree there's one God who created everything. We agree that this one God requires certain things, morality and conduct. So let's, let's start loving our neighbors ourselves because we all agree in Judaism and Christianity that this is something important. Let's recognize there's one God. Let's recognize that we are called to love our neighbors ourselves, all right, that lies are wrong, that injustice is wrong, that, that mistreatment of other human beings is wrong. So let's agree on that. Now, let's re- who was Jesus? Who do you say he was? You say he was only for the Gentiles? Well, then how, how could it be God for the Gentiles, not God for the Jews? And, and then have the dialogue. So I would start, since you're talking about unifying, let's agree on what we agree with. Even though I was talking to a Muslim, okay, we agree there's one God, one God only. Now, I don't believe Allah is the God of the Bible at all. We, okay, we agree on this, this, this. We agree that we shouldn't be killing each other, slaughtering each other. Okay, let's agree there. So at least we can live next to each other without shooting each other. And now let's have a conversation. Should I believe Muhammad? Should I believe Jesus? Who is really the prophet? Who's really leading us to God? Hey, I'm, I'm sure there's more to your question, but for time's sake, needed to jump in. Angelo, I appreciate it. And that's why I'm going to combat lies. I'm going to combat lies against the Jews because that you have to understand a lot of Jews think that's what Christians do. They lie about them and they kill them. That's what they've done through history. So I'm going to combat the lies and show, no, real Christians love Jewish people, even while we say you need Jesus to be saved. All right, uh, let's go to Nicole in Texas. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hello, Nicole. Hi, Dr. Brown. Yeah, you're on the air. Well, I watched the show yesterday, and uh, I think after I also was looking at the chat, I think most of the people just wanted to hear Ted's view as radical and anti as it was, and I, I too disagree with him. But I think that's sort of even a caller from Sydney is trying to say to just have a dialogue, not prove to Ted our view or him prove to us his yeah. view, but to just have that and to really ask that question. And so I guess that's my comment. Got it. But also, um, do you struggle with um, responding you, I mean, I, I usually don't see you get emotional, but I felt like you got really emotional towards Ted. And it, I just wanted to know what what stops you from kind of hearing his view but not being offended, I guess. Yeah, thank you so much. And if I fell short in any way, I, I absolutely apologize. That's why I rewatched it uh, to see uh, what was go- what was going on. And, and as I looked at it, especially knowing why I was asking him uh, – having him on and what had been set up, uh, his views are among the most vile I've ever read about Israel and the Jewish people. When you have Jews who were butchered by Christians because of lies that were spread about them in the Middle Ages, I mean, horrific lies that were spread, whole Jewish communities burned at the stake because they were lied about. And Ted Pike says that the, the Christians were so moral that they were offended at the sexual perversions of the Jews and killed them. And that's one of the ugliest Thing. So it's just like I'm not going to have a Holocaust denier on and have a friendly dialogue and, and uh, you know, and just, oh, so, okay, that's an interesting perspective. I'm going to say that's ugly. That's wrong. You know, if they start blaming the Jews or here, I, I just saw somebody post this um, earlier and um, uh, basically calling for an uprising against the Jewish people. And, and saying that the synagogue shooting's false, all the mass shootings are false, and the Jews are behind them. I'm not going to tolerate that garbage. So what happened yesterday was we were explicit as to what we were going to talk about. And the moment I brought it up, he took personal offense. And then uh, he's claiming that, that there's a, a, a subterfuge, an Orthodox Jewish subterfuge, lying about what's in the Talmud, and I'm adding to those lies. So here he is spreading perversions. He's been doing this for decades. You got to understand, he's been doing this for decades. He 
He's got a website filled with garbage accusations against Jewish people, claiming that according to the Talmud and the Kabbalah, that Judaism plans to destroy the Church of America through starvation and torture. I mean, ugly, perverse, crazy accusations that have spawned all kinds of Jew hatred over the years uh, among those that have read his stuff and those that I've been interacting do you, with. Do you feel? Do you feel that you should just remove yourself from people like that and not even have that debate or conversation? No, I want because he contacted us. Uh, I would okay. not ask someone like that to come on normally, but because he contacted us, I said, all right, I'll have him on, but only if we're going to go in that direction. The moment we went there, so he, I wanted to do the very thing you're asking. I wanted to have him expose his views as ugly and perverse and demonic as they are about the Jewish people. I wanted to have him do it, but I made a decision when he started interrupting, when he started claiming that I was lying about what's in the Talmud and joining with the subterfuge, and he didn't want to go there, he just wanted to go back to the other bill, I, I decided we're going to have very ugly radio. In other words, if he stays on, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an ugly battle. It's not, going to, it's not going to be good for listeners. There's going to be interrupting back and forth. Uh, when, I, when I really correct some of the, the, the ugliest errors and statements, he's, going to, he's either going to drop out or it's going to degenerate. Now, with E. Michael Jones... We had a very, very civil discussion. Uh, he's much more of a scholar than Ted Pike, but we, we had we had a, a civil discussion only to find out afterwards that he didn't realize that I thought his views were anti-Semitic. So I thought, wow, I said but it do, right at the outset. Do you, recom do you recommend, though, like, and I guess I'm trying to get advice, too, when you do have those people that are just a radical, that you just really have to cut it off and just not talk to them? Uh, yeah, at a certain point, yes. My goal was to expose, okay. and that's why I had him on. But, Nicole, listen— if in any way I disappointed any listeners, viewers by not being as gracious or, uh, and look, yeah, I had emotion. I was grieved and upset, but I've said to E. Michael Jones, let's have a formal moderated debate. I've said it to Rick Wiles. I've said it to Ted Pike. I doubt any of them will do it with me. Maybe E. Michael Jones would, I'm hoping, but let's put everything out and let's expose the lies. Truth will triumph. Nicole, thanks for being a faithful listener.